And today we have a special guest, my baby brother, Eagle Wits. Also, uh, he's a stand-up comic. Blah. See, that's why we have these extras. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Eating While Broke. I'm your host, Colleen Witt. And today we are outside the typical L.A. podcast studio and into New York City, where I'm originally from. And we are not cooking. We're eating out today. And we have a special guest. And this special guest is my baby brother, also known as my little brother, stand-up comic. You may have seen him on Comedy Central, HBO. He sells out a lot of secret shows all over New York City can catch him at the cellar. I mean, you literally can stalk his Instagram and try to find a way to catch him, but I promise you it'll be an amazing night. So, Eagle Wit. What's good? What will you have us eating today? Dollar slices. Dollar slices. So, dollar pizza slices. Yeah. Okay, okay. So is this something you ate on the regular or was it like you were cooking up something else in this the kitchen? This is what I was eating before stand-up paid, like doing the open mics. And, you know, you get a dollar slice. My boy, shout out Usama, he he would uh, he actually taught me, he was like, if you put hot sauce on the slice, like drizzle hot sauce on it, it's almost like the pepperoni's there. Like you could taste the pepperoni. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to do that every day. We'd ask other comics that had more money than us for a dollar just to go get a dollar slice. Now, have you ever, like, now that you, I would say you're, I want to say you've arrived in your career. You're definitely, you're definitely doing well. Would you, do you ever randomly, like, get starving, hungry and say, let me go get a dollar slice? Or Fuck you... no. <laughs> That's how much you hate it. Yeah, it's over. It's over. Okay, okay, okay. So, on a one to ten, if you were comparing pizza slices you have the dollar slice versus your average slice. Like, where does this dollar slice range? You could get a really good dollar slice that's like a six. Where? Out of a ten, you know? How? <sighs> you mean like a random, like, just one day it comes up and it's a decent yeah, slice? Some of, them, some of them dollar slice places be all right. You know what I mean? Oh, for real? But you wouldn't never do But, I mean, it. it's not messing with a real slice. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what did you cook in the kitchen when you were struggling? Gross shit. Like Way what? worse than dollar slices. Like what? I would get this is I had a three dollar meal I would do every night when I get home late from open mics. I would get ramen. Mm -hmm. I would get like a can of peas or corn, yeah. and a can of tuna. And okay. I would because you got the protein, you got your veggie, and you got your starch. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I put that shit together and mix it up. You know, drain it a little bit, put it even on a pan a little bit. Okay, okay. Yeah. Did you add butter to your, like, sometimes with ramen, very I would... Very rarely. Okay. Very rarely. Oh, I used to try to make it smooth with a little butter. But let's just go ahead and try these dollar slices. We had to improvise today because we had to do the Uber Eats or however. So we're just going to eat a slice of pizza just to kind of try to get into what you were going through while you were uh, working your way to the top. So we're going to take a, okay. a bite. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Taste the poverty. It's nice, ain't it? Well, it's good. The pizza's cold, so I can imagine it was like terrible. It was bad. It was it was this bad. It was bad. Mm -hmm. I remember, like maybe a year into your stand up coming to New York, and you had you were legit like borrowing a dollar from me to to buy a slice. Cause it's real. Yeah, it was real. <laughs> so there was one dollar slice place where the dude you talk to him long enough, he just forget that you didn't pay, and he just let you walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my boy used to go there all the time. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Would you guys just chatter him up? Just talk to this nigga forever. You go there and... Let there be a cute girl in there. He really forget. Okay, okay. Yeah. So tell us what was going on at that time when you were doing these dollar slides. You put it on. <laughs> well, you know, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, I was open micing it. You know, you don't get paid to do open mics. Shit, sometimes you pay to do open mics. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Doing like... No exaggeration, like five to thirteen open mics a day. I leave mm -hmm. early in the afternoon, like two in the afternoon, and come home two in the morning. Wow! And just did that for like probably like a year and a half, two years. And, and no part of you was like, oh, uh, I don't know, maybe this isn't for me. Or did you get frustrated? Did you ever have like a day job or anything? 
Kind of, but not really. I couldn't keep a day job because it was like to do that much stand up, you had to kind of just commit to it and be broke. Mm-hmm. Is like is the only way to get really good. I would like go in and out of day jobs, kind of. Mm-hmm. I remember, man, I did Postmates, <laughs> and oh, you did Postmates, bro. Is oh my god. I don't want to slander a brand on a no, podcast, go for it. but man, slander away. They get, it's like they you make just enough money to get hungry from walking around to buy food, and then you're back broke again. And that's just <laughs> how it goes. It's like you deliver food that also makes you hungry because mm-hmm. you like smelling people's food and mm-hmm. shit. And then you like, well, I made five dollars off that. I gotta get something to eat. And then you, the five dollars is gone. And you're like, all right, well, I'll just deliver some more food. And then you deliver that food. You like, I'm hungry again. <laughs> and you just, it's like a weird fucking thing you're in. You just make no profit. <laughs> like it's terrible. What other jobs did you? Didn't you uh, like? I think you house sat or something. Didn't you do some of those apps? I would house it. <laughs> I I uh, I house sat. I would I use this uh, app. Uh, what was it called? Task Rabbit. Mm-hmm. And I was terrible at making furniture. I would do like the IKEA furniture shit. Mm-hmm. But I was getting so many bad reviews. I I made a crib and the baby fell. Like it was like all <laughs> fucked up. And. Uh, and then, like, I was like, all right, well, I'm only going to do, like, pet sitting and house sitting because mm-hmm. then I get to stay in a nice crib mm-hmm. and I get to just chill mm-hmm. and I could just charge a lot. And I was yeah. doing it for a very short amount of time because I was fucking girls in the cribs mm-hmm. and somebody had, like, a camera or something. Somebody found out I fucked in their crib and it was over. Like, it was, like, bad reviews all <laughs> on the shit. <laughs> and I was kicked off TaskRabbit. <laughs> oh, is that how TaskRabbit that... was making money, too. I was making money off TaskRabbit. Damn. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so was there ever a point in your career where the struggle hit, where you had to like possibly reevaluate, or did you have pressure coming in where people were like, maybe you should just quit and get a day job? The the funny thing is like, I think with stand up is funny because like people don't care about stand ups enough to tell them to quit. They just look at you like you're stupid for even trying. <laughs> it's like the idea of them telling you to quit doesn't even come into their head. They're just like, you, really, you do stand up, and yeah. they just walk out. Like that's it. There's no like second sentence. I interviewed a couple comics like Lunell, Earthquake, and one of the things that they have pointed out, which I never even thought about, I don't know if anyone ever thinks about this when it comes to comedy, but if you're listening to like your favorite Beyonce or Jay-Z record, you go to their concert, you want to hear the same song, you know, that you've literally played in your your CD or your, you know, your AirPods a million times, but with yeah. comedy, you never want to go to a comedy club and hear the same joke, so... I was started to think, I think out of all the jobs in the entertainment business, your job has to be the most stressful because you're dealing with council culture and you're also dealing with like constantly like re 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 coming up with new materials. So like, how do you find that balance? Like, how are you able to like, are you sitting at home? Like I got to write today. Like I want to know like a day in the life. I'm very lucky to be like just a, not, like I'm, I'm a prolific creator, as my manager would say. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I come, I, my turnover rate's really high, but I feel bad for niggas whose turnover rates aren't high. Like my turnover rate is very, very high. What do you mean by turnover rate? Like how quickly I could come up with new material. Mm-hmm. Like it's very fast. Like if I if I do a set on Comedy Central, I could burn that material. I don't like to, but I could burn that material and come up with a new set pretty fast. Yeah. Now, like every year at this rate, I'm probably 30 new minutes a year, which is pretty fast for my for my point. But at some point, when you like 20 years and you like Kevin Hart, Burr, you know, these niggas, it's like you should be able to come up with like an hour a year, which is nuts. Nuts. But I'm not there yet. Now, when you release a joke online and it trends, that's technically considered you're retiring a joke. You're going no. into that retiring of a joke. I'm very on the fence about that. I don't know. What do you mean? Spill it. If, if it, I mean, it's not on contract. I don't have to retire it. It's like one day if a special comes out and there's something that's online where I feel like, oh, this would make history in a special, I might just delete it off the internet and put it in the special because it's my content. I'm the one who shared it. I own it still. Okay. So, because one of the comics that I had interviewed in the past had said, like, you know, once you release a joke, you really shouldn't say it again on stage. Like, how do you feel about that? I disagree. I, I highly disagree. Because it's like, who's seeing it? Even if it goes viral, even if it's like 3 million views, which like I have stand-up jokes that have like 3 million views, that doesn't mean that like when you do a show, whoever's there has seen the joke. Your fans have, for sure. Mm -hmm. But to me, the concept of putting out a special or something like that is to gain new fans. Yeah. yeah. So it's like your new fans aren't going to be people that have seen that joke. When you do a random show at a comedy club, guarantee you the crowd has not seen that joke. It's just like viral is not that big. Okay, okay. 
Now, I would consider, so people, different people have reached out to me about you and said, okay, they would compare you to a Chappelle. And they say that mainly because you straddled, you, you straddle the almost cancel culture. <laughs> like, you say the shit that is like, that shit's funny, but ooh, like, you know, like, yeah. Do you ever get nervous when you're writing content where it's like a little bit scary? No. In the cancel culture range? No. Have you ever feared cancel culture? No. Not, not, no, not material wise. So there's never been a point where you were like, I like this joke, but I don't know. No. Okay. But I have been pressured into dropping jokes, which very, like, is, a, is inner turmoil all the time for me. Can you give us like an example? I have a joke about Asian people that I got pressured into dropping once the Asian hate thing started happening. And I was really annoyed. Because you know what I find? It's like the people that get offended at the jokes aren't the people the joke is about. It'll be like you write a joke about Indian people and a whole bunch of white people get mad. You'd be like, nigga, this isn't even about you. <laughs> and Indian people be smacking their knees. This shit's so funny. We do like curry. You know what I mean? Like, And it's like, but the white people be like, this is an outrage. Or like yeah. black people be like upset for Spanish people. Like it's never the people the joke is about. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole bunch of people that feel bad for the people. Got it, got it. That makes sense. So it's sense. like, it's just annoying. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, I had people tell me to drop the Asian joke, but when I would do it, after the shows, pe Asian people would be taking pictures with me. They'd be like, man, the joke was so great. Finally, somebody talking about us. It's but like, this is what we talked about. That makes sense, because if black people, I'm just speaking from black perspective, if we hear a joke that's clowning on black people, we're going to laugh. Yeah. Yeah, that, I never even thought about it like that. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know. I can't speak for every group of people. There's certain groups of people for sure that definitely, you know, probably get super offended. Yeah. But. So I'm going to throw a wild card in here. Um, well, I got a couple more. I got some, some more questions before I throw the wild card. Just remind me that I have a wild card in here that you're probably not going to want to answer. But um, uh, has there any been, uh, has there ever been like uh, another comedian that gave you some advice that like was pivotal? I know so you many. personally told me stuff about Bill Burr is my favorite comic, like one of my favorite comics. Burr gave me great advice. Yeah. Can you share some of that advice? I was about to tape something for Comedy Central. It was like my first like straight up stand up set. Didn't have to do with the TV show. It was like straight up. They were, I mean, technically it's a show, but it's like they were just doing stand up on it. And I was super excited, but I was like nervous about mm -hmm. what material to choose. It was like fresh out of the pandemic. The pandemic was still going on, so I was rusty. And, uh, I asked him, I was like, man, there's certain bits I want to, like, save for a special one day. And he was like, what are you saving it for? Like, like you're, he had just seen me do stand-up. He's like, you're funny. He's like, believe in your talent. He's like, believe in your talent. He's like, if you believe in your talent, that means do your best material because you could die tomorrow and this will be your legacy. Mm -hmm. And then come up with new material. Mm -hmm. And it should be better than the previous material because it's new. So, like, don't ever hoard material for a rainy day. Because mm -hmm. that rainy day may ne might never come. He's like, that's wow. all ego telling you, like, I'm going to have a special one day. I'm going to have this. It's like, yeah. you don't know that. Yeah. You have an opportunity right now. <laughs> put out your best shit. Wow. And then move forward. Wow. And he was like, if you, if every chance, he said, every chance you get to be on TV or do stand up in front of a mass audience, that's a chance to get fans, to get industry to like you, to get everything to work in your favor career wise. Mm -hmm. So do your best shit. Like, don't hold back. Okay. Uh, that was really good advice because I was about to hold back. Is there anybody else that gave you something that was like stuck out? There's so many. I, I had a comic tell me, Derek Gaines, he told me never play to the back of the room. That was big early in my career. What does that mean? That means don't play to the comics. So some comedians do stand up. The back of the room, the idea of the back of the room is like comedians will hang out in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. They don't sit, they hang in the back room because there's no seats for comedians. Yeah. And some comedians will very much try to make the comedians in the back of the room laugh. Wow. And it's like, cause it's like a, it's almost like high school. Okay, it's like okay. very like, I'm the, f I'm funny. You guys, right? Yeah. But the crowd would be like, eh, cause crowds and comics don't laugh at the same shit. Yeah, yeah. So like that was very good advice. He was like, comics will never pay your bills. Like yeah. these niggas would dap you up yeah. after the show. They're not gonna pay your bills. The people in the crowd are gonna pay your bills one day. Yeah. Now, what's like the worst situation you had when it came to hate? Cause I'd imagine that the more successful you get, there's gotta be little issues of hate or something that creeps in, right? I mean, comics talk shit, but comics are always going to talk shit. I don't, yeah. I don't really face any crazy hate. I'll tell you what, when I did that Comedy Central set that Burr gave me advice on, I did the joke about white women getting shot by the cops. And two days later, after it got released, the insurrection happened. And a white lady got shot by, like, 
like a security guard or something. He wasn't even like a cop, but he was like a security guard for like the Capitol or whatever. Mm -hmm. And man, they was on the internet acting like I was psychic or Illuminati. Like they, the, the internet's so dumb. Like everybody's so <laughs> conspiracy theorist about anyone in show business. <laughs> they, like so, like she got shot, and they was like, you know, that comedian just talked about it, and then, then it happened. Real mysterious, like yeah, yeah. real ho teppy type of energy. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, nigga, I'm not psychic. I don't know. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, it's just yeah. a joke. Yeah. So. Speaking of like how people respond to certain things, I have to ask you, um, I don't even know if I even asked you about your view on the whole, and I don't want to bring it up. I really am. I want to retire just for the sake of everyone's health, mental health in this, but it came to the Will Smith, Chris Rock slap. Fuck Will Smith. Firmly. I will say that on a podcast. Fuck Will Smith. What? Yeah, I don't what? care. Fuck Will Smith. Why? Uh, that's crazy. He knows. He knows at this point he was wrong. If I say fuck Will Smith and I'm a comic, he if he was to ever see this, he wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, of he's course. had other people say fuck him. I'm sure since. Yeah. But I mean, um, it's terrible for stand up. Like you are setting a precedent where it's like, if you get offended at something a comedian says, you can literally physically attack them. Yeah. That's crazy. And yeah. not only is it setting a precedent, but it's like the the level of precedent is like. You smacked our king. Like, there's nobody bigger than Chris Rock. Like, you yeah. smack Chris Rock, you are smacking stand-up. You are saying, like, if Chris Rock can get smacked, any of these niggas can get smacked. That's true. Because he's true. the he's the biggest and the best. He's the most legendary. So it's like, if, if you smack him, it's open season for everybody. So, okay, so I understood that. Also, he's working. It's like, he smacked him while he's working. Like, I yeah, don't understand. Yeah, it was, it's like, it his was, job is to do what he did. I definitely... It was so funny because I actually don't watch. I think it was the VMAs. I I don't. It was uh, the Oscars. The Oscars. I'm not one of those people that watch the Oscars. You know, my husband is like an actor slash is actor slash comedian, so he lives for that stuff. And the one time I'm watching it, I see the slap, and I'm like, "Oh, is this what I've been missing?" Like, <laughs> I said, "Oh my god!" I thought it was staged. I was like, immediately went to my phone because I was like, "YouTube will have clips in seconds." I'm like refreshing. Like, was that real? And I was like, oh, shit, I need to watch this show more. Like, I did not know. But, you know, of course I understood the perspective. You can't hit a comic. You know, there's multiple reasons. But then the softer side of me was like, you know, Will Smith's been in the game a long time. And there's so much pressure. And especially, like, it's one thing when you're like Cat Williams. Cat Williams has this bad boy. So when Cat Williams, like, gets in trouble and goes to jail, it's like, we're like, oh, it's Cat Williams, you know. But Will Smith has this, like, squeaky clean personality and i felt like you know i don't want to know i know us as women we put a lot of pressure on our guys like one like you know you're in a great relationship when you can like yell at your guy and he just like shrugs his shoulders like whatever like you know she's crazy today it's tuesday that sounds you know? toxic as fuck but no, okay but, no for <laughs> real like for real but you never know because sometimes women we put our men under pressure so i don't know like i don't know what was going on in their relationship for him to like just snap but i definitely think that is that in the industry so much pressure that it's like I think him saying I'm sorry for me was enough to be like that's fine we're human like I've snapped on people that I, I've regretted. Here's my it. issue with the apology right is it came months later and that night he apologized to the whole academy and all the actors but he didn't apologize to Chris Rock. It's like literally the night you smacked that nigga you had a chance to apologize to him and you avoided apologizing to him. You apologized to everybody else in the room you didn't apologize to the person you smacked. It, to me, if you wait months and then apologize, it's like, okay. Like, I hear it. I'm, I mean, good. It's not a bad thing. So well, now I know if I piss you off just to apologize within a certain time frame. I mean, he literally smacked this dude on national TV. Okay, okay. Apologize that night if you're going to apologize to anyone. Yeah, yeah. I feel like every comic is going to agree with you because it's, most it, most comics you'd be surprised but most comics well, oh there's some that are like me there's that some are like, comics oh. that are like well you know Will you know his wife blah, blah, blah. like shut up man yeah I mean if you got to think Will Smith contributed a lot of happiness to a lot of kids I love Will Smith I, I love Fresh Prince of Bel Air that's my favorite know? TV show ever yeah for real yeah but now it's huge like, Will Smith he's my he used to be my favorite actor to that smack <laughs> I think you'll forgive him. I think so. If he went, do you think he can even walk into a comedy club right now? Probably not. I mean, he could walk into anywhere. He's an A-list celebrity. I'm saying though, do you think he would get like booze or like some kind of shade from comics? I'll tell you what. I've seen Rock walk into a comedy club since, and I've never heard an ovation like the ovation they gave Rock. Yeah. Tears came to my eyes. 
Yeah. I've never been so moved by an ovation. I couldn't even imagine what he was feeling. Yeah. Like, I think fans of comedy very much are like, we love you, Chris. Sorry that happened. Yeah. You know? You, uh, it's also just like a bully move. Like, look at Chris Rock and look at Will Smith. Like, I don't think Will would... I know that we've all heard this, but, like, I don't think Will would have done that to fucking, like, insert if Bernie Mac was still alive or... Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he very much, like, picked who to do it to, and it's like, that, to me, rubs me the wrong way. But... That's the thing. It seemed very impulsive. So I don't know if it was like one of those things where he was like, today I'm going to get Chris Rock. How impulsive was it? He laughed at the joke first. Like he laughed at the joke and then he looked at Jada and he was like, oh, all right. That's why I said I think, women put, I think women put men and like you just never know what's going on in someone's relationship. I think that like I'm not saying she's to blame, but you never know like what is going on that contributed maybe he was clowning her at home and i don't know stuff took a turn you but you know what it is man is the sad thing about it is it's truly just the disrespect of the art form because it's like Will's the same person who months prior to this happening had a whole series about how you want to learn how to do stand-up and he invited all these comedians on to help him and he was getting into the stand-up art form and he loves it and i don't want to do it but i just want to do it as a hobby i want to get to experience it and it's like nigga you love stand up, but you don't love it enough to respect it as like a respectable like craft and work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't smack anybody else while they work in. Like you have to. Res- First of all, he's the best worker that we have. Yeah, yeah. It's like the most professional stand up comedian is Chris Rock. That's why he ain't hit Will back. No, he handled it well. But speaking of, I don't want to get spent too much time on Will Smith. <laughs> I, you know, just a little smidget because I want to get more out of you. So what a lot of you guys don't know is that Eagle and I have a, a definite age difference. We're not going to say what it is. And so we grew up a little differently. And so I want to know a little bit of your backstory because I missed the chapter of where the inspiration came for you to pursue comedy. And I also want to know a little bit about what your childhood was like. Um, everyone told me to do stand up. I didn't want to do this shit. Truly. When you say everybody, like who? Friends, mom. I can say mom because we got the same mom. Um, we were the same parents, but yeah. <laughs> I left home at 16. You know, there's a, there's an age difference. But like what what environment did you grow up in? I'd say, um, you know, mom was like, uh, it was just me and mom. It was mm-hmm. just me and mom. Mom was going through a lot of mental stuff. Mm-hmm. And mom would cry a lot, mm-hmm. like every day. Mm-hmm. And I'd come home from school and just tell her, like, funny stories, literally from, like, elementary school. Mm-hmm. And she would just crack up, start laughing. And we watched Comic View all the time. We watched Friends. We watched anything that was funny, mm-hmm. kind of get through the, through the pain. And she would always be like, you funnier than everybody on TV. Like, you cracking me up with your little school stories. She'd be like, you could do that. You could do, we watch Comic View, which isn't, the, you know, but whatever. <laughs> it's not the best. But mm-hmm. we watch Comic View. She'd be like, you could do that. You mm-hmm. could do better than them. But I was, like, a little kid. I'm like, no, this is stupid. Like, she's crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Yeah. But then in school, like I started having friends I would hang out with my and colleague. I always give him credit. First friend that he was like, nigga, you a stand-up comedian. You just don't know yet. Like, you funnier than everybody. Mm-hmm. And that was like young. That was like 13, like real young. And uh, it started spiraling where other friends would kind of hear colleagues say it or they start feeling the same way. Yo, you should do stand-up. You should do stand-up. And I always be like, no, 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 I'm not a clown. Because I ain't respect it. Mm-hmm. That's the interesting thing about the art form is it is very not respected because people just don't know what goes into it. Yeah. And I originally didn't respect it. Okay. I was like, I'm not a clown. That was my response. Okay. But then I was like, you know, like 21 and like, what am I going to do? And they could be homeless. Like, I didn't have anything to do with my yeah. life. I was in fucking community college. Like, I was like, nigga, what so am I doing? So you did go to college and you're For sitting. For like two semesters. Okay. So you're sitting there in class and you're still debating like what Sitting there in the you're... hallway hollering at girls. I never went to class. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So then where does this epiphany, like, screw it, I'm going to try it? Uh, I was, well, when I got out of high school, I was thinking, like, something comedy related, but mm-hmm. I was really scared to get on stage. Mm-hmm. So I was, like, making, like, YouTube videos and, mm-hmm. like, stupid shit like that, but it wasn't really gaining much traction. I was just scared to get on stage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, dad took me he was like well let's go to let's see what type of stage stuff you might want to do mm-hmm. so he took me to the ucb mm-hmm. at the time that when it was open is an improv mm-hmm. place and i watched improv it was like a saturday night and i was like Ugh, not this like mm-hmm. i don't want to be on a team with a whole bunch of people all happy go lucky improv yeah. and stuff uh then he took me to the comic strip and it was late night my boy to this day jordan rock chris's little brother ironically in this conversation he was on stage he's around my age and I remember watching him and being like, oh, he's funny and he's close to my age. 
Yeah, yeah. I feel more like I, maybe this is something. Yeah, and I yeah. got his info. Okay. And I started hitting him up every day like, bro, I'm scared to get on stage. What do you think? And he was like, nigga, it's just trial and error. Like you go up, you try stuff. It doesn't work. Fix it. Yeah. Do it again. Yeah. And I didn't understand it for months. And then one day I kind of cracked and just tried it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Hated yeah. it. Quit for three weeks. You convinced me to get back I, into it. I was going to say, I remember getting a phone call from you saying like, I'm going to try it. And then you, you went up one time and I think you said, nah, I'm good. And yep. I was like, I think my advice it was shitty advice. Kind of. I was like, just try it three times. You can like drink, you can get high, you can just figure out how it is and just try at least three times before you quit. And then like you did stand up like one more time and you were like, yeah, I'm good. You never did drugs to do it either, yeah, right? Yeah, no. All it took was one great response from the crowd. I remember the joke. What was the joke? It was, uh, I just turned 21. I don't drink. So I Google what you could do at your age and you can adopt kids. So I'm going to adopt a 17 year old and boss them around. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like this whole like bit about how I'd basically adopt a nigga who's basically my age. <laughs> and like, yeah. And Make that was like the like bit. And it got bit. like a huge response. People <laughs> clapped and shit. And I was like, oh, this, like, I want to do stand up. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started doing stand up, did a lot of girls enter the scene? Like, oh my God. Like, cause I've seen, I've gone out with you. I almost walk into rooms with disclaimers. Like I'm his sister. Definitely don't want him. You can have him type attitude. Like, do you think that being a comic, there's a lot of uh, like girl fans or with every comic or just the select few? I'll say this. I got pussy before stand up. Oh, <laughs> like okay, there's okay. a lot of comedians who definitely like lean on. There's a lot of people in show business in general, I yeah. feel, who lean on like I'm this person and girls like that. And yeah. now I lean on that to get girls. Mm -hmm. To me, that's just toxic and very yeah. tricky waters. Yeah, yeah. I don't do that. Like yeah. I was getting girls before stand up. Get girls after stand up, during yeah. stand up. Like, it's not about stand up. Stand up does help. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was chilling before. So, I I don't know where we are time wise, but, um, but I do want to know is there any interactions with, say, someone that you looked up to that was like, ugh? Bad? Yeah. Like, was there a celebrity? And you can name drop. Oh, I, I'm not doing that. What? Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, well, <laughs> can you just tell my us? own sister trying yeah. to ruin my career? <laughs> hey. Every celebrity I met has been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, celebrities aren't like someone because they're not like agents and managers, but I guess they can still hate on you a little bit. Like, what if they what want you to go on the road or something? They're yeah, like, comedians are the most helpful people in my career. Everything I can, everything I've gotten in my career, I can attribute to a comedian. Wow. Industry has not given me shit straight up. I'm sure they hate to hear this on camera, but it's the truth. Fix it if you guys don't like it. Like, co comedians have helped me get everything. Okay. Even stuff I've gotten from industry, it's been, like, started through a comedian down the line at some point. They got my foot in the door. Okay. So when you were going to tape, when you taped Comedy Central, mm -hmm. you, you get, how does it work? Like, tell us the scene. Like, tell us what you're doing when you get the phone call that you're about to do this. Like, I want to know all the details well, and I all taped. the motions. Three or four times. Mm -hmm. I've done three, three or four times I've done Comedy Central. The first time I was, uh, I did This Week at the Cellar, mm -hmm. TV show that was on Comedy Central for a couple seasons. I was the new comic at the Cellar that was like getting all the spots, mm -hmm. right? New, young guy. Everybody loved me. SD at the Cellar loved me. And it was very much just like they were taping it. It was a Cellar show. They were pushing all these comics on SD that weren't past the Cellar. I was someone who was past, who was a new, young buck. I they were like SD kind of helped book the dates so she threw me a bunch of dates for tapings but that doesn't mean you're gonna get on mm -hmm. you have to kill mm -hmm. you have to be topical I killed was topical got on and like I I would love to say more about like my little ideas on like what went on that helped me get on but I'm not gonna do that but I will say I killed I got on it came out great very happy what was your emotions at the time, though? Like, especially as your first Comedy Central, like, what were you? Were you... So nervous. Okay. I was so nervous. I remember the first taping that got on. I fucking hate it. It's cringeworthy to this day just looking at it. Is Oh, uh, I got to find that. All right. <laughs> I did a joke about, because um, it's all topical, we get mm -hmm. the seller. Which, by the way, super hectic, the mm -hmm. way they make us write. Mm -hmm. It's literally, it's like the day of they give you the topic. You got to okay. fucking write a joke. Okay. And then doing it in front of a live audience. Okay. So the joke I did was about how Trump had pardoned ASAP Rocky. 
Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I remember that and one. And I stumbled through I the wording. The joke, the joke hit. People like it. But I watch it, and I'm like, boy, did I stumble through that wording. Because I was so nervous. I was so <laughs> fucking nervous. It's like my first time that taping for TV. That was a great joke. I don't think... Yeah, I definitely don't remember seeing any stumbles. Oh, I, every time I see it, I notice. I'm like, ooh, what the fuck was I saying? Do you watch all your stuff? Because I know some comics that will not watch, like, their taped Pussies. shows. Really? <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I don't think Darius watched his Netflix Pussy. stuff. Really? Oh, I watch. Say it. Say it to him. I uh, watch. It's not easy, but I watch. Really? Yeah. I are you now? Are you one of the comics that still record all your sets, or you don't record? I your record sets? all my sets. The audio. Okay. And yeah. do you play them all back? No. I used to when I was like starting out. I'm real bad at it now. I'm real bad at actually listening to them. Really? But occasionally, if I need something, like last night, you mm-hmm. saw me. I did a new tag off the top of the head mm-hmm. that was crisp, like it perfect and mm-hmm. hit. I'm going to go back and listen and figure out how I worded that. Now, you you don't do open mics anymore, correct? No. Now, when you have a new joke, are you working it out during your paid sets? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. You're, 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 you're extremely confident in like, you know. Well, at this point, I'm confident that I can make any set go well. Okay. So okay. like, you know, you got a new joke, depending on the room you're in, you might just do new jokes. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you're so confident in that room. Yeah. But like if I'm at the cellar or something like that's a high pressure room, it's like I'll throw it towards the middle of the set. Maybe, you know what I mean? Or, or it won't be the first time I've said it. Maybe I said it a couple other times in mm-hmm. other places, but either way, if the joke goes bad, I'm confident in my skills now that one joke going bad isn't going to ruin the set. I can quickly Mm-hmm. flip it into something that kills and then just kill for the rest of the set. Okay. So for new comics, like what's a day in the life of a comic that's arrived? Uh, waking up whenever you'd like. Um, and uh, you go out at night and go do stand. It depends where you live too. I mean, in New York, it's like literally every day you're working and you are doing multiple sets a night. So like what hours are you working like? like 8 p.m. to like 3 p.m.? Like, what are your hours? I can leave the crib around 7 some mm-hmm. nights and get home at 2 in the morning. Okay. Um, Or I could leave some nights at 9 and get home at like midnight. It depends on the night. Okay. But usually the earliest I'll be out of the crib usually on average is like 7, and the latest I'll be in the crib now that I got a girl is like, <laughs> it's like 2, 3. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, 2 yeah, really. <laughs> I remember coming to New York a couple of times and hanging with you i tried i tried very hard to hang out with him and be that supportive sister when he comes to la i call myself like his uber driver this was before he had a license like i would be like okay i'm gonna be his uber driver his his little cheerleader or his number one fan i'd say and then um but when i come to new york it was almost like i would have to literally put like a red bull drip in my veins because I mean, it got to the point, I got to a certain age, I was like, look, bro, just just bring me a chopped cheese and a Snapple, like, when you get back, because that was your thing at night. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you would get home at, like, four or five, and that would be, like, pretty much my breakfast and your dinner. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. stand-up in New York is, like, real. Like, it yeah, is, there's a reason there's been, like, TV shows about it and shit. I mean, it is it is truly the mecca. Yeah. Like, it's constant. I look at comedians as entrepreneurs, because... You know, from an outside perspective, you know, you're thinking about, you know, your art, right? You're putting Mm -hmm. your art out, but you have to manage like your bookings and your times and being on time and your negotiations and how you're going to like build this career. So it's funny that, you know, from like an audience perspective, you're like, oh, this guy's just charismatic and he's funny, but... You know, and then, you know, also the fact that we're like, make me laugh. Like, you know, you go to a comedy club, you're like, make me laugh, dude. Like, that's why they serve alcohol, right? But then it's like knowing you guys up close, it's just like there's so many attributes to comedy that I'm like, the whole world doesn't even like consider. And then, like you said, it's almost like people just don't respect the craft. Even my I was thinking about the entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial level the other day because I was I was talking to talking to my girl. I was talking to her about um how comics like that aren't getting doing doing stand up for a living can't like some of them can't wrap their head around or put the energy into the concept that like the way you turn this into how you pay your bills is a slow build of like okay I'm making this much amount every month guaranteed 
Okay, now next month, if I add these rooms, these comedy clubs, I'll be making that much a month, mm -hmm. every guarantee. You know what I mean? It's like eventually you get to a point where you're guaranteed that you're going to bring in a certain amount every month yeah. because you've just built it that way. Like my earliest books of like counting every month, I was making like 160 bucks in January, 80 bucks in February. You know what I mean? Oh, for the whole month. Yeah, for the whole month. But so I was then, keeping track. So then stretching them dollars. Them dollars yeah. slices was... For but real? the thing is, when you're doing what you love, like, you you counting those $20. You know what I mean? You're yeah. like, damn, I made $20 this month off stand-up? I fucking made it. Now, oh, my what, God. You know, you feel so good. Were the comedy clubs feeding you? Because most times when Fuck I hang out. no. These comedy oh. clubs don't feed you until you, they, they, they give you half off. <laughs> oh, dang. You know, occasionally you get fed. But by the time you're getting fed by comedy clubs, you already got enough money to pay for your own shit. But Damn. in the beginning, when you're starving, they don't give a fuck. They like, yeah, do this stand up. How long did it take you to go from? I mean, we really want this transparency, but like, I know you've been at this for a while. But yeah. how long did it take you to go from eighty dollars a month to get to where you're at, where you're like, you know, I know you're doing well. Surprisingly, not that long, like a year or two. Okay, so a year to well, I mean, for most people, like living on eighty dollars a month for a year or two. Is, but I mean, but it feels like forever. But it didn't feel like that to you. It huh? don't feel like that, especially because it's like you know, it's like eighty, and then it's like you hit a certain point in the year, you're making like two hundred dollars a month. But mm -hmm. you gotta think about it. That's like a hundred percent fucking upgrade in your yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like you, you feel like you, damn, I'm doing something. Yeah, like yeah, two hundred dollars yeah. a month. What? Yeah, yeah. Like you feel because you gotta think. Is this how I used to say it to my comedian friends? I'd be like, nigga. If you, I had someone tell me this too. They were like, uh, he's my OG at the time. Nico told me this. So I'm actually stealing from him. He's like, if you make $40 a month, mm -hmm. that's a Metro card. Boom. <laughs> that's a bill paid. Okay, bill okay, paid okay. off jokes. Okay. You know what I mean? You make $100 a month. That could be dollar slices all month. You know what okay, I mean? Okay, okay. It's, it's just, it just adds up. Okay. And before you know it, you like, oh, I'm paying rent. I'm paying for food, I real like food. That. I like that. I like that. Metro card. You know what I mean? Before you know it, you like, I could get some sneakers. Yeah. yeah. You're actually making money. You got to pay taxes. Yeah. I got to pay taxes. <laughs> now, there was never a point in your career where you thought, nah. No. Okay, perfect. So Still no. Okay, okay. So what piece of advice would you give to a comic coming into the game? Just worry about being funny. Worry about being funny? For real. Just do as much stand-up as you can and worry about being funny. And if you suck <laughs> and you're terrible after years and years, after like five years, nigga, quit. <laughs> now, but wait. Now, I agree. So, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm just curious now that you say that. Because I meet guys that are like rappers or they think they're, they're rappers, you know, with passion. But, you know, like they're like. Not good rappers. And they're at it for like 10 years. You know, you meet that 45-year-old guy selling CDs. I don't know why guys are still selling CDs on the street. I don't know why. Nobody's playing a CD. Nobody no has one's a playing. CD I player. I feel so bad. Laptops like, don't even got CD We'll be in Los anymore. Angeles and they'll be harassing, signing CDs. And I'm like, where are they going to play this? Where are they going to play? I haven't seen a CD player or a DVD. I actually... I don't even know where these niggas burn the CDs at. What, yeah, are, you, what I, are you using? A I, Dell I, fucking 1998 <laughs> computer to make your, your record? But when you see these 40-year-old guys that are still rap and you're like, Ugh, you know, like I used to have a rule. Like I wouldn't even date someone in the industry. I didn't want to run lines. I didn't want to do any of that stuff, you know. But with comedy, like even seeing your growth, you were fun. You were always funny. But your level of funny right now is like I describe Eagle. And it's not because he's my baby brother because I have no problem keeping it real with people or just avoiding the conversation to not keep it real with people. But <laughs> but when I describe you, I'm like, oh, he's going to be a legend. He's going to be up there with the Richard Pryors because of the style of comedy. Like, I have no doubt, like, the way you write. And I would love to know before we close out, like, how you, like, what your writing process is. Like, I don't know if you're eating lunch with your girlfriend and she does something quirky and you're like, let me write about that shit. Or, or you're joking with your homies and then you make a joke and then you write it. I, I would love to know, like, genuinely, like, or are you asking right now? Because yeah, I thought you was going to say go something for else. It. Oh. I have, I have, um, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I, well, there's two ways. So one way is if we chill and we talking and I say something funny, I've gotten to a point now where I could tell the difference between like funny and convo funny and funny that I could actually translate on stage and kill with. Okay. So if I say something funny in convo and it's that level where I could translate it on stage, 
I'm like, okay, I'll take that. Also, it has to be what I care about talking about. Because now I'm at a point where, I think a lot of comedians get to this point. Most comedians get to this point. You get to a point where you're so good at stand-up that you could, like, make anything funny. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you could be, like, write a joke about this napkin. And by the time we get out of here, by the time you get done with your next interview, I have 10 jokes about that napkin and eight of them bitches be funny. But. We may challenge them, but go on. <laughs> but for real, for real. But when you get to that point, mm-hmm. you start going, I don't want to just talk about anything. Yeah. Because now it's boring. Yeah. So you very much find the shit you care about and the shit that makes you laugh and the shit that makes you go and wonder and think. And you go, I'm going to write about that. Yeah. So like in Convo, if I'm talking about something I care about, something that's fun to me, yeah. interesting, I'll write about that. Yeah. Or like, uh, it's popping my head when I'm on the train. Write it down. But it has so to be you something writing. I care about. You're writing. Or writing yeah, in your notes like or something? Yeah, but barely. Like, oh, okay. I don't write the way I used to. I used to okay. fill notebooks front and back pages. Okay. I so got now you're like notebooks. Jay-Z with it. Very much so. Like, I very much will write down an idea. Mm-hmm. And then I go on stage and kind of freestyle it, mm-hmm. record the set, and keep on shaping it and sculpting it like got Play-Doh. It. Got it. Got it. All right. All right. Yeah. I, I don't know if I missed anything, but I will tell you this. This is uh, this has been. Exciting. They were saying I'm the best guest you ever had. That's what they were saying. That's why I was looking over there. <laughs> I appreciate y'all, y'all. Thank you, man. They did they say that's that? what they said. They said I'm the best. No, that he they ever said had. he said five minutes left. They said top five. That no, alive. he said five. He said minutes top, left. top 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 oh, five. Oh, we have ten minutes left. Ten minutes left. He said I'm. I'm what's what's top the time five. on the clock? He said you got no minutes left. He said I'm the best. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for uh for you know I, I've had the dollar slice with you before, but thank you thank you for making my life easier and um, making this an easy dish. This is the brokest version because we got little cups of water with the dollar <laughs> slices. <laughs> And we don't have the hot sauce to fake the pepperoni. Yeah. Just, <laughs> and the, the slice is cold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but thank you so much, Eagle. Eagle Wit for y'all. And what's your Instagram? Eagle Wit Official. Thank you, Eagle Wit Official. If you guys want to catch Eagle Wit, you're more than likely going to have to be in New York. Otherwise, you have to go online, stalk his Instagram, find out what city is. I think you can actually DM him. Yes. Oh, I do have one last question. I know we're going to go over time. But confessions, your confessions on Instagram. I, I'm not a big Instagram person, but he has this thing where you go on Instagram and he, he tells his fans like confessions. I've never seen it before. But if you go on Eagles Instagram, his fan base is absolutely hilarious. It is better than scrolling through Instagram. When he opens up his confessions, people will go on there admitting crazy stories. But then sometimes his fans will interact with the stories yeah. and like add they've, to they've it. They started doing that and that has nothing to do with me. That's their own creativity. Yes, and it's funny. It'll be like, I slept with my dad's sister's mom and then and the then other person will be, like, will be like, I'm they dad's sister's mom and let me tell you. And yeah. you're like, this is what you're and doing. And the stories take a turn for the, for the best, but I don't think anyone has a more creative and open fan base. They be admitted to like stealing each other boyfriends, sleeping with they my I'm, boy told me, he was like, nigga, you need to talk show the way people open up to you. They he was like, yeah, they, they just like, tell you whatever. I promise following you on Instagram, like I would say when I see confessions go up, I think it's like what, every thousand followers or something. That's the, that's the new thing I've been doing. Every thousand followers, I'll do confessions. Yes. And he'll be like, you know, if you don't know, he'll tell them the rules. And it is on and popping. There is no better day than a confessions day on Eagles uh, stories on Instagram. And I, I'm not even kidding you. If you're a fan of like Jerry Springer or any of the above, it's entertaining, especially when the fans interact with each other and they just they like feed off the crazy ass stories. Yeah. 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 So shout out. Uh, you can catch Eagle Wit or confessions at Eagle Wit uh, official. Um, and thank you so much for being my guest. New York edition. Peace out, y'all.